Playoff hockey is almost upon us as the Quinnipiac men's and women's ice hockey teams prepare for the ECAC hockey and NCAA tournaments. Our Q30 beat reporters are ready to dive deep into postseason discussion. So let's drop the puck. Inside the ECAC starts right now. Welcome to Inside the ECAC. I'm your host and Q30 women's ice hockey beat reporter, Clever Streich. And I'm joined by my fellow beat reporters, Anthony Rossi, Andrew Reynolds, and David Kleffer on the desk. Gentlemen, the ECAC women's ice hockey tournament starts on Friday. Who's ready for some playoff hockey? Couldn't be more ready. Oh yeah, I'm so ready. First year that I get to see this, so I'm super excited. Yeah, I agree, Rossi, same here. But I mean, hey, women's hockey, they look good this year. Excited to get into the ECAC playoffs this weekend. All right, let's get underway. The women's ice hockey team enters this year's tournament as the third seed and will face six-seeded St. Lawrence. But the regular season ended for Quinnipiac on a sour note with a two-game losing streak and only three wins in their last six games. At this moment, do you think Quinnipiac is more of a contender or a pretender for the ECAC title? Anthony, we'll start with you. All right, so for this, I, have, I think that they have the talent to win the ECAC tournament, but we'll get into that a little bit later. St. Lawrence series is definitely going to be a little bit difficult. Uh, again, I'll get into that a little bit later. But if they get matched up against Yale and Colgate, I think that they'll probably not win because Yale and Colgate are really, really good and really talented. But, yeah, let's hear about you guys. Well, I can start us off. Um, I think I absolutely do think they are still a contender in this. Um, I think counting out uh, this team is a huge mistake. They have so much talent. They've had such a good run this entire year. Yeah, they've had it rough. They had one of the biggest hiccups in NCAA women's ice hockey, possibly ever. Um, but, and it's been a little rough since then. There's no lie about that. But we've seen the talent this team has. We've seen the depth. We've seen how good they work as a unit. And I just, I just think it's a complete and utter mistake to count them out. I agree with you, David. I do think that this team is a contender for the ECAC title. The question is, is can they bounce back after, this, after the two-game skid they had this weekend? You know, they are a contender just because, you know, you have Colgate, Yale, and Quinnipiac. Quinnipiac beat, swept Colgate, Colgate swept Yale, Yale swept Quinnipiac. Those three teams are the top contenders for the ECAC title. I think it's a toss-up, but Yale does, I think, have the advantage since they are the number one team. Um, but I don't know if they'll be able to bounce back after those, you know, those two games that they lost this weekend to St. Lawrence and Clarkson. You know, when you look at ever since they lost that game 11-3 to Princeton, they have not been at their best. They're 3-2 and two in February, which is... That's their record since that Princeton game. And I just don't think that they're one of the best. I just don't think that they'll be able to bounce back after that, uh, that losing streak they just had. All right, let's move on to the next topic of discussion. One of the best problems to have for this team is more than one viable option between the pipes. In the Bobcast case, both Logan Andres and Katie Boudiette have posted strong 2022-2023 campaigns. Andrew, if you had the choice, which goaltender would you start for the upcoming playoffs? You know, it's really a toss-up for me. I think that Andres ha or Andrews has really looked good all throughout the entire year. I mean, she's stood through the pipes. She's, she's been the main person for this team. Uh, she was on the U18 national team for Canada, but I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to take Boudiette here. I think that she has just played better. I think she's looked better. I mean, besides the statistics, you know, Boudiette, I mean, Boudiette, she, or Boudiette, sorry. She, is, she beat the number two team in the country at the time on New Year's Day. She shut them out after the three, nothing loss that Andres started in where they, where they lost that game three to nothing. So I think that's my main, that's my main like argument for Boudiette being the better player goaltender but I do think it's a pretty even toss up there I agree and we can all say we've heard we've heard head coach Cass Turner say it a million times this is the best problem that a team can have is two fantastic goaltenders in net but I'm gonna have to side with Andrew here Katie Boudiette has had in the starts that she's made a fantastic season when you're in that position as the backup you need to make those starts count and she has done that and then some like you said, her only loss of the year is a game that she did not start. She only played four minutes against Princeton. Um, and that's, you look at that game, I mean, 11-3, to three, you got to count it as an outlier. 
yes, it was rough. But looking, looking towards games that Boudiette has started, we see four shutouts on the year, one of which was Wisconsin, a huge win, one that Logan Andres was just not able to capitalize on the day before. Also, looking at the set, she is a .959 save percentage on the year. That is huge. She does not let much past her. Yeah, and she's been out of the lineup recently, but we'll see if she gets factored back in. So, Rossi, are you agreeing with the crowd or are you going against the grain here? I'm agreeing with the crowd. I mean, Boudiette's a way more talented goalie than Andres, in my opinion, and I think we all can say that. But I think that Cass will go with Andres, personally. Cass trusts Andres. She's a grad student, so obviously she's going to trust the more experience. And Russ never wears off, so we'll see how Andres does in the playoffs. All right, well, let's take a look at this year's ECAC women's hockey bracket. The first round best of three matchups are now going to show up on your screen here. Uh, David, which series intrigues you the most out of these matchups? We have Yale and Harvard, Clarkson and Cornell, Quinnipiac, St. Lawrence, Colgate and Princeton. Well, so I'm, this is something that I think I'm going to come back to later, but I'm looking at this Quinnipiac St. Lawrence series. St. Lawrence has one of the most talented goaltenders in NCAA hockey right now. Lucy Morgan is an absolute stud. We've seen her give the Bobcats some trouble before. I will not be surprised to see her give them some trouble again. I'm gonna, I actually agree with that, but I'm gonna say Clarkson versus Cornell is the better series. Uh, in this first round, I mean, in the beginning of the year, Cornell blew out Clarkson. They beat him eight to one. And then a few weeks ago, they played each other again, and Clarkson had the better of them. They won two to one. So I think that, well, Clarkson will, I think, in my opinion, I think Clarkson will take the series uh, three to, uh, three, two to one, rather. Um, but I, I think it's the better series. I mean, it's a, it's a closer matchup. You have, a, you have a blowout versus a close game. So that's, that's my opinion on that. Where, Rossi, what about you? I mean, I agree with David, but I'm just going to highlight the Princeton versus Colgate series. I believe that that's going to be an underrated, really good series because Princeton came out and beat Quinnipiac 11-3. to So it's definitely going to be interesting to see how they compete with Colgate. Yeah, and since we've talked about all the other quarterfinal series, I guess I'll add a little bit in about Yale and Harvard. Harvard playing in the outdoor game against Quinnipiac um, at Frozen Fenway. They've recently had some struggles. They're down in the eighth spot. Yale's looking pretty unstoppable, and Yale just dominated Harvard this past couple of weekends. They just had a matchup, and they scored, I believe, 8-1 was the final score in that game. So we'll see if that uh, will end up being a two-game or three-game set. So like I mentioned in our last question here, there may be some upsets, some unexpected results in this year's women's tournament. So let's talk about some teams that might be under the radar. Starting with Anthony, who is your pick for a dark horse sleeper candidate in the tournament? So my sleeper candidate, and I think David might agree with me with this one, I'm gonna say St. Lawrence. And yeah, he actually agrees with me. St. We'll Lawrence has Lucy Morgan, like we talked about. She's one of the most talented goaltenders in the entire ECAC. It's crazy. Julia Gosling is so good. And if St. Lawrence gets the opportunities, they're going to beat Quinnipiac, I feel like. This game is, there's, this series is actually going to go to a three-game series. Mark my words on that. It's going to happen because Lucy Morgan's good. Andres is good. Boudiette's good. It's crazy how good these two goaltenders are. And it's just a sleeper pick. And I'm excited to see how St. Lawrence performs in Evansy Bank Arena. You know, Anthony, I, could, I really couldn't agree with you more. I, I've had, uh, like I said before, Saint, uh, Lucy Morgan for St. Lawrence, we've seen her give the Bobcats some trouble before, and that's not an easy thing to do. This team is all about offense, even down to the blue line. They are constantly shooting to score. Lucy Morgan was able to put up a .914 save percentage on the year with uh, 1,837 minutes of total ice time. That is a lot of blocked shots. On top of that, this team has offensive talent. They're able to produce offensively. They have a good defense. Lucy Morgan's just that factor that takes this team from good to elite. Um, well, everyone said St. Lawrence. I'm going to say St. Lawrence as well. Hmm. Um, you know, <laughs> number, is it, yeah, what? Bit of agreement. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is um, I did. I, I expected this because St. Lawrence, I mean, they're the number six team in the conference, but they don't look like the number six team in the conference. I mean, you have right here, Julia Gosling, I think, is one of the most, best players in the ECAC right now. She just walks up, wins this game in overtime against number 12 State, uh, sorry, number 12 Cornell in the country. Julia Gosling, like I said, I think is the best player in the ECAC. And then you also have Lucy Morgan right here, who's been keeping them in these, uh, or keeping St. Lawrence in these games. She has a nine, uh, nine four one, uh, sorry, nine one four save percentage, and two point two eight goals against average, which isn't the greatest stats, but she has really kept St. Lawrence in these games. You cannot deny that. And then again, Julia Gosling, she has eighteen goals, twenty six assists, and forty three points on the year. 
But he, but look at this, guys. She has four game-winning goals this year, which is a, which is huge for St. Lawrence. So can she get that game-winning goal against Quinnipiac in this series? We will have to find out this weekend. Hmm. I think it's a great thing to see that. We're all agreeing for some of the same points, but this team is ranked, what, sixth in the polls? And we've heard Cass Turner say it a million times. This just goes to show the ECAC is a tough division to play. Any team can win. There's a lot of top 10 teams in this conference. For the next question, let's peer into the crystal ball. Andrew, what do you predict will be Quinnipiac's fate in this year's tournament? How far will they go? So I think that Quinnipiac will uh, beat St. Lawrence in three games. That is, uh, that's, I think that's a fair opinion to make. I mean, Quinnipiac is the number three team in the ECAC going in against playing a number six. And St. Lawrence is a good team. We just talked about how good they are in the ECAC. They have split, they split the series this year. Julia Gosling, you have Lucy Morgan on St. Lawrence. But after that series against St. Lawrence, you know, I think that Colgate's going to take out their opponent in the uh, in the series. So I think that Qu if Quinnipiac and Colgate will probably face each other in the second round. Uh, and I don't think Quinnipiac will make it out of there. Quinnipiac did sweep them this year, but I think the game against uh, their series against, or sorry, they're going to play Colgate, and I think they're going to lose in, uh, in Hamilton. Well, so when I'm looking at this tournament, we agree on the start. I think uh, Quinnipiac is going to be able to top St. Lawrence in this series. I honestly, I think I have more faith in this Quinnipiac team than you do. I see the offensive talent. I see how well they work as a unit on defense. And they've already beaten Colgate twice. Now, by no means is Colgate a team to look past. That is a team with talent. They play tough. They, they frustrate the hell out of you. But I think Quinnipiac will be able to go over that and uh, – Beat over that hump. The real thing that they need to do, the real secret, is they need to figure out how to beat Yale. They haven't been able to do it yet this season. It was their first loss of the season, and it was a rough one. It wasn't pretty. Yale shut them down on every aspect of the ice. If they can figure out how to beat the Bulldogs, and I think they can because of how well they work as a unit, how good the coaching is, I think they got it in the back. Yeah, David, I'll add on to you. If, if Quinnipiac does uh, beat Yale, or if they beat them in the finals, Quinnipiac move up to number seven, I think, in the pairwise. And it'll move them up because if they don't win the ECAC, I think they'll stay at number eight. So it is, it's a big win to win the ECAC for Quinnipiac. And it'll help with the seeding as well. So, Rossi, what is your prediction on the Bobcats in this tournament? So my prediction for the Bobcats is I think they're going to lose to Colgate. And I think that Colgate's actually going to win the ECAC. So, Reynolds, you mentioned that Julia Gosling, you say that she's the most talented player in the ECAC. I disagree with you completely. I think that Daniel Serdakny is the best player in the entire NCAA and the ECAC. Sir Dacony has the most points in the entire NCAA with 61, and she has Kulti Kultanikova, Alyssa Biederman, Allison Simpson by her side. Those are, t those are points that are just crazy. It's unbelievable how good that they are. So I just think that Colgate's really good, and it's going to be a Colgate-Yale uh, ECAC tournament final, and Colgate's going to get that revenge that they didn't get last year to Yale. Yeah, I think, Rossi, I think that uh, Julie Gosling, I mean, yeah, she's I mean, Colgate players fine, but I think Julie Gosling is the most talented player. That's my opinion. I, I agree. I think she's good, but I, I think Julie Gosling just a little bit more talented than that. But can the can the numbers like speak for that? Like sixty one points in a season? That's crazy. But you I'm looking to, besides the you numbers. You have to here. admit though, that's insane. No, it is. It's it's a great stats. I mean, top. I mean, you know, look at best in the NCAA. But I think Julie Gosling again. Best talent, most talented player. And you have to put other players in that mix, like Gabrielle David from Clarkson. You have to put Olivia Mobley in that conversation. She's a dynamic playmaker, 40-point-plus season for her this year. Uh, so there's a lot of different teams that could be there. Uh, with the regular season in the books now, the Bobcats have made history. Upsets over top-ranked programs, outdoor hockey, and an overall record of 27-7. and David, compare this year's Bobcats to teams of old. Is this the most talented roster that Quinnipiac has ever iced? Now, you said it yourself. This team has made a history. We've seen some big games, and we've seen some big wins. But I do not think this has been the most talented team that we've seen. Interesting. I actually want to go back one year. Uh, we, look at, we look at where this team was a year ago versus where they are now. Last year, they had some big players like Taylor House and Kareem Schroeder who are able to continue their hockey careers into the professional level. The difference is... Uh, we, we lose Madison Chandler and Zoe Ewens. While they are two um, amazing first years, Chandler putting up a hat trick in her first game, uh, Zoe Ewens has been an absolute rock on defense. I just don't think the trade-off is there. Corinne Schroeder actually scored a goalie goal last year. Ab crazy play, something you rarely see in hockey. But Taylor House was 
a difference maker. It was a very big question at the beginning of the season. Will Lexi Agia be able to fill Taylor House's shoes? And while she has the two of them together, unstoppable. David, I couldn't agree with you more. I think last year's team was the most talented team. They handled Syracuse so easily in that first round of the NCAA tournament. And they took the number one team in the country, Ohio State, to double overtime. I'll repeat, I'll repeat that again, my mistake. Double overtime to the number one team in the country. They gave them the biggest fight that they had at the entire NCAA tournament. And Corinne Schroeder, she's on the number one team in the PHF right now, the Boston Pride. And Taylor House is on that team too. So those two combined this year have been crazy at the professional level. Who knows what they were like last year? Because I wasn't here last year to witness them in person. But I can tell you that these two players were absolutely crazy. And I can confirm for you, they yeah. were. <laughs> but this is an interesting counterpoint here. Uh, the Bobcats didn't win against Wisconsin last year. This squad did. Uh, so, Reynolds, let's hear your opinion about this topic. Well, you know, I'm going to take your clever. Uh, I'm going to take your point there, clever. I think this is the best team we've seen at Quinnipiac. To be honest with you, um, I mean, this is the highest goals per game that we've seen for Quinnipiac at 3.5. But this is besides the shortened COVID year. Um, and then also you have two great goalies. We've mentioned that Cass Turner has said this is one of the worst. I mean, sorry, one of the worst problems to have, which is, I mean, sorry, one of the best problems to have. Should I say my <laughs> fault? That was a that was a poor <laughs> choice of words there. Is to have two incredible goalies in Budiat and Anders. So. I think that, and then you also have, like like David said, you Matt said Madison Shantler the first year. The, the first years on this team have been incredible. They are the future of this program. And also, every, like every year after year, this Quinnipiac team gets better and better. All right, well, it is time to take a break. But when we return, we'll switch sides to the men's ice hockey tournament and welcome the men's ice hockey beat reporter team to the desk. You're watching Inside the ECAC. Welcome back to Inside the ECAC. It's time to swap sides of the ECAC and the desk. I am joined by men's ice hockey beat reporters Matthew Mugno, David Marr, and Gage Kilborn. Who's ready to break down the road to Lake Placid? You know, I'm really looking forward to it, David. I'm mean, excuse me, clever. Sorry about that. Um, it's been a fun season covering the team with you guys. So it's been a nice bumpy road to the finish, and we're getting right to the finish line. Yeah, I am too, and I'm most excited that Matt Bugno has come off the IR to join us. And uh, <laughs> glad to have you back, Matt, and let's have a good show. It's great to be back, guys. I love being with you guys. It's nice to be all in the same spot as once with Clever here, so I'm ready to go. Let's break it down. All right, the men's ice hockey team and the men's ice hockey bracket is still in flux with one weekend remaining in ECAC play. But the Bobcats have clinched the top seed. Let's review the current ECAC bracket. And we'll see that here. We have RPI and Union in the first round, St. Lawrence and Dartmouth, Clarkson and Yale, Princeton and Brown, and the top four seeds advancing to the quarterfinals, Quinnipiac, Colgate, Cornell, Harvard, Quinnipiac winning the Cleary Cup. Which series will stand out the most if the playoffs were to begin right now? Uh, Gage, you can answer that. All right, so normally you would think of the Capital Series because it's an 8-9 matchup, but I'm going down to the 7-10 between Princeton and Brown. I really like Brown a lot. I mean, Matthew Carone has been a fantastic goaltender. If he's able to come back and play for the Bears, I can see Brown going in, going in and probably making a battle with Quinnipiac in the quarterfinals. I'm going to disagree with you, Gage, right off the top. I think this 6 versus 11 matchup, Clarkson versus Yale, you know that Yale is 2-0 uh, against Clarkson in the season? They've just been dominant. Luke Pearson at goaltender gives the Bulldogs an excellent chance to win every single night. And Clarkson's been kind of up and down. You just don't know what you're going to get from them. They've been so inconsistent offensively. Yale's got a really good chance to steal that, a one-game knockout. Wouldn't be surprised if Keith Elaine has his squad ready to play. Yeah, and I think, you know what, David, you guys brought up two great matchups, and I think the Clarkson-Yale matchup's in there. And I think what would be interesting to see is Clarkson's style playing Cornell against each other. They both play a defensive style, gritty style play. And I think the series that I look – to the most is, I, I agree with you, Gage. I think the Princeton Tigers, they, they play a tough game against, they play up to their opponents. So I think it would be interesting to see, and that's probably the, one of the tighter matchups. I think we both, all of us brought up the tightest matchups that are in the first round. Well, the last weekend, we just saw the Bobcats clinch the Cleary Cup as ECAC regular season champions and a bye into the quarterfinals, like I just mentioned, of the ECAC tournament. Out of all the teams Quinnipiac might face in the quarterfinals, which matchup would be the most favorable for the blue and gold? Matt, we'll start with you. Well, they're kind of coasting in because they have that buy. So if they play RPI, if they play Union, I mean, RPI, they smoked at home 8-3. to three. Union, they also smoked at home in that same weekend. And their top line in Graf Lipkin, Quillen, put up monster numbers against Union. So I do think that at the end of the day, 
each matchup, I don't think there's really one that you say you favor or don't favor. I think if they were drawing a team that maybe is on the come up right now, maybe you'd worry about it. But I don't know what you guys feel with this quarterfinal, but I feel like it's going to be a breeze. Um, I actually am a little bit worried about a few of the teams, like Brown, as I mentioned, because they gave Quinnipiac a fight back in Providence. And, but that's why I'm going with RPI. I really think RPI is probably the best option, not just the best and the most realistic choice by how this bracket has gone so far. As both goals, as a, to get an idea, their goalies, their goaltending situation has a .891 save percentage. And like you said, they blew the engineers out of the water in Hamden last time, and yet they're going to play them again this upcoming weekend. So I feel like with that much confidence going in, especially in the ECAC tournament with how it's going to shape up, with a poor goaltending situation they have over in Rensselaer, I really think it's going to be an easy, that that's a best case scenario if you want to make it to Lake Placid in just two games. Yeah, Gage, I'm going to agree with you on a slightly different uh, way, but RPI does play Union in the first round. I think Union is the best is the best team in that tier, in that one game knockout. And I think Union has the best chance to win, and that I think is the favorable matchup for the Bobcats. You look at uh, game one between these yeah! two teams on Friday night uh, up in the Capital Region, but the Bobcats hung eight goals on Union in their first meeting. They outscored them eight to one in game one. Union also has one of the worst uh, goals per game against ratios in the ECAC. And Quinnipiac, that is a, uh, that's an all-you-can-eat all buffet for this offense. Mm -hmm. They can eat that Union defense up. They score a ton of goals. Their speed against Union's young defense is just too much. I think that's the favorable matchup for the Bobcats uh, in their quest to go back to Lake Placid. Well, we'll see which uh, team the Bobcats are going to end up drawing. They'll get the lowest remaining seed out of those first-round teams. Rand Pecknold's squad may be one of the top teams in the ECAC Hockey Conference, but how do they stack up compared to the other teams around the, uh, around the nation? David, what do you think? I think they're well-deserving of the number two ranking. Obviously, they've been a steady team all year long. Three losses uh, in some close fashion. They did sh get shut out twice by Cornell and Maine, and they lost a tough one at Colgate. Um, I think Quinnipiac is good against teams that have good defense and have an average offense at best, like the ECAC. They haven't gone up against too many high-powered offenses in the ACAC, but just really good defenses. Now, I am concerned about what happens moving forward if they have to play a team that falls out of bed scoring a ton of goals, like Western Michigan, Minnesota, uh, Boston University, Michigan, to name a few. Those teams not only play really good defense, and they've got a good backbone and goaltender, but those teams can score a ton of goals. How will the Bobcats' defense be able to go up against those teams that can score a ton of goals at will? All right, that's a, that's a good take. I mean, number two, I, I see them as a top five, but I don't know about two, because the number of some numbers, ECAC hockey, out of all the teams in ECAC hockey, they're currently in fifth in the conference out of the pairwise rankings out of all six conferences, with an average pairwise ranking of 34.67, which, it compared to a couple of the other schools, Big Ten conferences leading it with 11.83. So that pretty much means that the majority of their teams in that, co in that conference have been up near the top level of the country. So the, the matchups that Quinnipiac has had throughout the season has been near the middle of the pack towards near the bottom of the pack with LIU in there as well as Holy Cross. So their out-of-conference schedule has not been the greatest. I feel like going into the NCAA tournament where anything can happen, it's not going to go in their – it's not going to go right for them because of how um, how the NCHC is really competitive and as well as the Big Ten and the CCHA to name a few other conferences. All the Midwest schools have been very competitive this season compared to hockey, compared to the Eastern Coast, I feel. Yeah, only a couple of non-conference games in the Hockey East. UMass, for example, at the Friendship 4, a couple of games with Maine. Uh, Mugno, how can the Bobcats get ready for non-conference opponents in the NCAA tournament, potentially? I think it's relying on kind of that veteran leadership because they played in games against out-of-conference teams. They played in odd situations when they played Minnesota State in the COVID bubble year. I think what will be interesting to see, as you guys have brought up, is that there's different pockets and corners in the nation right now that have those powerhouses. Beanpot, right, we saw, we see the Minnesota teams are always on fire. I think to prepare, it's knowing that the level of competition you're playing is not teams that you face like Union, RPI, Dartmouth, Brown, Princeton. They're higher level teams. You have to think about how you prep, where, you, where your mentality was and where you were at mentally as an athlete against teams like Harvard, the, the tougher competition within your conference. I think it, that's how you go into those games. 
Now, I mean, I'm impressed. They've played, they played up to those matches. Like you mm-hmm. said, with Harvard and the UConn game, they, they were down 3-2 to two going into the third period. Mm-hmm. I was a bit worried, I'll be honest, a bit worried about seeing how that was going to shape up. But they came from behind and won. That's pretty, that resiliency is what they need, I think, to help out along the loan. And that's what they, they were able to show, the consistency throughout the season. To kind of add on to Gage's point, early in the season, they went to North Dakota. They had a big lead in game one, lost it. Then they tied that game. Huge win, uh, huge tie for the Bobcats. Then they beat North Dakota the next day. So mm-hmm. I think they do have the the compete level as um, as uh, as those other teams in the in the Midwest and our West. But you well, can't really use North Dakota as an uh, as an explanation because well, they're top twenty five in the well, Midwest right but now. They how, where, 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 they, where, where have they gone? They've been going down. So you can't go with North Dakota as an option. But yeah, they yes they did well in North Dakota, but. They've been dropping like a rock this season. It's not like last season, North Dakota. But they play in a really difficult conference that features a lot of top 10, top 15 teams. Like okay. St. Cloud State, Western Michigan, Well, Denver. they competed with them last season. This season, they're dropping like a rock. What's it? Okay. Can they you? can score a ton of goals. That's just my point. They can I, score I goals. But, you, but they, they give up a lot of goals. <laughs> they were number three in the nation at the time. And if you look at it, they had to fight back to tie the game. That was a high-scoring game. And since then, we don't really have a measuring stick for where to put uh, the to who the Bobcats could face. That's the toughest opponent they faced, number three team in the nation at the time. Happy to have you back, Mongo. <laughs> <laughs> I asked this question to the women's beat reporting team, and there seems to be some bad blood between the men's team right now. But with the first round and quarterfinals coming up soon for Quinnipiac, what are your predictions for the ECAC hockey tournament on the men's side? Gage, you're up. All right, so I was um, flipping through a couple of teams. I had like five or six teams I was running through that could possibly make it to Lake Placid. And one of them was actually Clarkson. I felt like that Clarkson, if they really get on the roll right, like I know Luke Pearson and Yale, but they don't have an offense. Yale doesn't have an offense. They can probably squeeze through with a little more offense for Clarkson. And then if they play probably Cornell in the quarterfinals, well, they beat Cornell about a week or two ago. So I'm not going to have much confidence. I mean, they'll probably go to get three games and then maybe have them go to Lake Placid, pull off an upset over Cornell. But I then thought over probably not going to happen. My, top, my um, final four is Quinnipiac, Cornell, Harvard, and St. Lawrence. I think St. Lawrence will be the fifth seed of the tournament, but they'll come away and take down Colgate in three games in Hamilton. But in the national, in the ECAC title game, I have Cornell taking down Quinnipiac to win the white loss. And the reason why is if Ian Shane can produce, and usually Ian Shane in the postseason is very scary to watch. And I know that they don't have much of an offense, but defense wins championships. I'm going to go with that same mantra here. Yeah, Gage, you know, I do see what you're saying. I think there will be some teams that might surprise us. That's the nature of the conference, right? There's there's a clear divide between the top, what I see as the top three teams, and then those that are in the middle, and then there's really the, the low end of the RPI, the union prediction. I'm Listen, I think it's really between QU, Three Horse Race, Harvard, Cornell. I think those are the top teams, and we'll probably see a three-peat between the Bobcats and the Crimson again. David, I don't know what you think. I'm uh, interested to hear. I, I have a similar Final Four as you, Mungno. I have Quinnipiac, I have Cornell, I have Harvard, and I have Colgate. I think Colgate is a team that the Bobcats are going to narrowly escape. I really think Colgate is a team that is really on the cusp of getting right to the Bobcats' compete level. They're young, they're physical, they've got a great goaltender in Carter Guylander. The Bobcats will escape Colgate in the semifinal. And then Cornell will beat Harvard just because of what, Gage, you just mentioned. Ian Shane having what could be the game of his life against the Crimson. ECAC final. I talked to Jacob Quillen after the Brown game. He told me that this mindset is not to, you know, keep winning these trophies and think, oh, the season's over after that. It's to get right back to Lake Placid and Mm -hmm. to finish what they started last year. They have that championship mindset. They are coming for it all. And I think that leadership that you talked about with the veterans on this team, with the offense that they have, and the missing links they have on special teams, Quinnipiac will take the trophy from Cornell, and they will uh, become ECAC champions in 2023. Didn't they say that last season, though, that, they could, that they're going to try to win the white loss? Didn't they say it last season? Um, it's a new year gauge. I'm just saying. All right. Did I'm they say it last season? Did I'm they just, say it last season? What happened last year? Yeah. Did they, did they win the Did they win the white law last they year? They want to correct. They want to correct the mistakes of not winning the white law cup from last year. That's why I think that their their mindset. They're built to win the big games. I think that they will just beat Cornell in the what should be a classic ECAC title game. Well, provided that they don't go to overtime, they have a better shot than they have had <laughs> the last two years. This year, the NCAA. 
parity has been the name of the game. The mantle of the number one team in the country has been up for grabs, and it seems like Minnesota and Quinnipiac are neck and neck for the top of the USCA show polls. David, can you compare and contrast the Bobcats and the Golden Gophers after a poll where they split first place votes evenly, 25 to 25, and were only separated by three points, as you see right there? It's really tough. These two teams are so evenly matched. They have a ton of offense. They have also really good defenses as well. There's two matchups here. There's the one on the ice, and I think that's Minnesota. They're so balanced on offense and defensively, and they have so much NHL caliber talent on this offense mm. that they just come at you at will. They're so aggressive offensively. But the one edge that I think Quinnipiac has, if they were to go up against Minnesota, is coaching. I've, I've watched Minnesota a couple times, especially in like the last game of the uh, season of a series against a Big Ten team. They really struggle. They don't really have a game plan. Bob Motzko, I feel like, is just putting a, a talented group of players out there and doesn't really have a game plan. Rand Pecknold is like Bill Belichick. He mm. takes away what you do best, and I think that's the one matchup I could see Quinnipiac having over – the edge over the Golden Gophers, I think, is coaching, and it comes from the bench. Yeah, you know what, David? I actually 1,000% agree with you. You look at Minnesota's top players. You look at Snuggerud, Nice, Faber, right? Some really talented players. Didn't even mention Logan Cooley there, who won the World Junior Ch uh, Bronze Medal with Sam Lipkin. I think something that's notable is the fact that the Bobcats this season have scoring threats. They have four lines. They have 3D pairings that you could put out there safely. Last season, I think what happened was there was a little bit of brand. Why Bon Giovanni was not playing to the level that I thought he could. Ty Smolonic did not play to the level I think that everyone thought he could. This season, you have more of a team effort. You have guys that have been there. You have the younger guys contributing. And as you mentioned, they're not these brand names. And that's sometimes what I think comes away from Big Ten hockey is players like Cole Caulfield, Keandre Miller, they're on a team, but... They're not really playing as a great cohesive unit as Rand Pecknold has the ability to roll four lines out, roll his three D pairs out, and Peretz is playing great. So I do think if you're measuring them up, that it comes down to the talent versus the team play. And it's developing for the NHL versus developing for a national title. Mm -hmm. That's really the point that Mugnut's trying to make, I think. Yeah, it's really, I mean, going off of what you said about how it's more about the team aspect, to get you an idea, Colin, Colin Graf, that they say Logan Cooley is like, you know, the next great thing. Graf has more points on the season than Logan Cooley does. He has 47 compared to Cooley's 44. And the di another big difference I noticed, I was crunching some numbers here, Cooley has scored a point in about 25 of the games that, that the Gophers have played. That's 70% of their games. Well, Colin Graf has scored in 84% of the Bobcats games. And when they score, they win. They're Quinnipiac 24 and 1 and 2 when Colin Graf hits, gets on the score chart. Meanwhile, Cooley, whenever Cooley scores, they're 21 and 4 for the Minnesota. And when they when he does not score, they're 2 and 4 and 1. So if they end up facing each other the national title, I, I mean, they got to try to find a way to get Logan Cooley off the score sheet. And if they do, they'll probably have a better chance of coming away with a victory. That's like their main strategy. And like how um, you said about Rand Pegnell taking the game away from them, it's Logan Cooley is the one to mainly go for. Well, at the end of the day, White Law Cup aspirations aside, there is still a national title up for grabs. The Bobcats are on a mission to clinch a berth to the big dance in Tampa Bay. Gage, how can Quinnipiac travel the road and make a return to the Frozen Four for the first time since 2016? Well, it's going to be very special. And I'm going to say special quite a bit because it's a special teams unit that's really stepped up. And the main way is this season, the special teams unit has gone 20. Last season, they went 20 for 139. That's a point. That's a 14.4% in the power play unit. This season, they jumped up 10% to third in the ECAC conference. They've really turned around the power play unit. And it's been started by Colin Graff alongside Ethan DeYoung and Zach Metzler, like leading the charge in that power play unit. It's been very lethal on the attack. And that's the thing, going into the NCAA tournament, talking about the draft, talking about the last time they went in 2016, the Frozen Four, they went 3 for 11 route to the Frozen Four in 2016. That is around the same numbers that they're seeing right now. If they keep up with their power play unit and keep scoring that amount of goals in the, in the tournament, in the NCAA tournament, they'll have a good shot at making the Frozen Four and possibly making a run for the national title. Gage, I couldn't agree with you more. I think special teams is absolutely the key for the Bobcats in the, in the, uh, when they get to the Frozen Four. I go back to last year against Michigan. They were horrible on special teams. They were, they were 0 for 2 on the penalty kill. They were 3 for 3 
Um, or excuse me, the Wolverines were two for two on the power play. They were three for three on the penalty kill, including a shorthanded goal in the first period. That, that's embarrassing. And I know that Michigan is really talented at that time. They had a ton of NHL caliber talent. But the Bobcats were in that game. They came back from four goals down to cut it to one with just over 10 minutes to go in regulation. They had a chance to win that game, and they had a power play late in the game. They couldn't bury it. As a result, they ended up losing that game. But I can't help but wonder if they were able to get one power play goal. That would have changed the entire complexity of the game. Now they have Colin Graff on special teams. He's the missing link that they have. If their special teams can be the X factor that gets them forward in the postseason, they certainly can make a long run to the national championship. I see where you guys went, and I do agree. I think special teams is everything. When you have the extra man, you have to capitalize, especially against the top teams in the nation. I think it really comes down to new blood. You brought up Graff, uh, David, total mind blowing. You brought up Colin Graff. And I think he is key on the power play, and their power play has been running like a machine. But something that I do think is overall, that line in 5v5 play is going to be crucial because I think last season, the season before, they played a really talented Michigan team. That's a tough draw. And the season before, they were playing teams that really weren't that talented. The Ivies weren't playing in the ECAC. They go and they draw Minnesota State. They have the lead and they blow it. A few strange years, the last few years. I think whoever they draw, it really comes down to can those lines produce? Can they produce? They're young. We'll have to see because in the CT Ice Tournament, although they defeated UConn, they did not produce against UConn. And I, that was something that interesting that I noted from that game was that the Graf Lipkin quote line did not come through in that game despite the fact the team won. Now, granted, small sample size, but it'll be interesting to see what these guys do on the bigger stage as first years and sophomores. Well, that is it for tonight's show. Thank you so much for watching Inside the ACAC. A special shout out goes to our great beat reporting staffs and to everyone behind the scenes for making this show possible. To follow for more Q30 content throughout the ECAC postseason, as well as our weekly shows, Sports Pause and Bobcat Breakdown, visit our website q30tv.com and follow us on Twitter at Q30Sports. For our beat reporter teams, I've been your host, Clever Streich. Good night from Hamden.